Hey guys, this is Nick and welcome to my Linux experiment. Now switching to Linux can be a daunting proposition. There are a lot of things to consider, like erasing your hard drive, choosing a distro, what are you going to do, dual boot or not? So many considerations and it can be scary and it can put people off. So I'm starting a video series that will explain all the different steps that you need to take in order to move to Linux. And this first video is going to be the list of all the steps that you need to accomplish with a little bit of detail for each step and I'll go into more detail in future videos about every single one of them. So if you're ready to move to Linux, let's start. This video is sponsored by Linode. Linode provides Linux servers that make it super easy and affordable to host your own app, website or service right in the cloud. The interface is really easy to use and you can start your own server in just a few clicks. The best part is the one-click apps. Linode has a lot of services you can install on your server with just a click, like OpenVPN. Unlike third-party VPN services, using Linode and the one-click OpenVPN app allows you to keep total control of your data, privacy and security. For $5 a month, you can use Linode to host your own VPN and be certain that all your data is in your hands. Sign up for your free account today and get a $20 credit, which amounts to 4 months of free VPN, just by clicking the link in the description. So the first step is back up your data. Obviously, you need to back up your data. Whether you're thinking of moving to Linux or not, you need to back up your data. It's really easy to do. You just plug in a hard drive and you copy paste the files. You don't need a specific backup tool. You don't need a specific carbon copy cloner, image recovery thingy. You don't need that. You just need to grab all the files that you want to save and copy them onto an external storage device that will not be plugged in when you try to install Linux. That is all you need to do. Now, the second step is to check your components online. Like Linux is mostly compatible with almost everything these days. It's not the same thing as in the early 90s or early 2000s. Nowadays, most things just work. GPUs, not a problem anymore. You've got the free drivers for AMD and Intel, and you get a proprietary driver for Nvidia cards, which means that graphics cards are pretty much done. CPUs, SSDs, hard drive disks, they're not a problem. Where you might have an issue, though, is Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So what you need to do is check your components online. You're going to look up the model and the make of your Wi-Fi chip or your Bluetooth chip and you're going to look it up on Google, for example, with Ubuntu after that or Linux after the, after the name of the model you have. And this is going to give you a good indication if this thing is compatible with Linux or not. And if it is, what are the steps that you need to take to ensure that it works? Now, if you also have some weird peripherals like capture cards, like gaming accessories, steering wheels or stuff like that, you should probably look them up as well with the exact make and model. It's going to be a lot easier for you to prepare your transition like that. Now, once you've checked your components online, it's time to move on to the third step, which is choosing your distro. And this is where a lot of people get lost. There are so many choices and so many recommendations online that are completely contradictory. The first question might be to ask yourself, what is a distribution? And a distribution is very simple. It's the Linux kernel, the GNU operating system tools that allow the kernel to communicate with other programs. You've got the X Windows server or Wayland, which is a display server and allows windows and menus and menu bars and a desktop to appear. And then you have the desktop environment, which is uh, the interface you're gonna use and the various programs you installed on top of that. That's a distribution. And there are so many of them. But the choice can be boiled down to two simple questions. Are you a beginner or are you already familiar with Linux and have you used it before? And do you need simplicity or do you need customization? If you're a beginner and you want simplicity, you go with Ubuntu. It's the simplest choice. It's going to have the most documentation online. Its interface is simple. And if you don't like it in the meantime, you can probably install another desktop environment on top of it without any issues. Ubuntu is the safe choice for new beginners. If you're an advanced user and you know what you want, you probably don't even need these guides. So just look up online various distributions, try them out, live boot them, etc. Now, if you want customization, I would recommend you go with KDE Neon, which is a distribution based on KDE, the highly customizable desktop environment, or you go with Linux Mint or anything based on the Cinnamon desktop environment, which is highly customizable and looks good. And there might be a third way, which is uh, if your computer has low power and low resources. In that case, I would recommend you go with something like XFCE, uh, maybe probably Xubuntu, which is a great distribution. XFC is a desktop environment that is very lightweight and will allow your older computer to run pretty nicely as well. Now, this brings us to the fourth step, which is uh, creating a live USB. Now, for those who are not familiar with Linux, a live USB key is what allows you to boot to Linux 
without messing up your existing hard drive. What you're going to do is download the .iso file, which is a disk image file that you can download from the distribution's uh, website, and you're going to copy it onto a live USB key. So what you just need is a USB key and the ISO file and a program. I would recommend Etcher, which is a very simple one. You just select the ISO file, you select the USB key and you click start and it does everything for you. Now what a live USB is, is a live system of the distribution you chose, which is going to run from the USB key and not from your hard drive. This means that every change you make, everything you test, this is not going to affect your hard drive and your existing operating system. So if you don't like it, you haven't deleted anything, you haven't messed up anything on your system. And if you like it, you can install from the live USB key. And this brings us to the next step, which is booting from the live USB. This one can be a little bit more complex. Uh, some computers, you just plug in the USB key and they're going to boot automatically from the USB media. Some of them are configured to boot from the hard drive by default and will not boot from the USB key. So what you're going to have to do is go into the BIOS, which is this little weird, ugly screen that you get at the start. Uh, you can bring it up with pressing escape or delete or backspace or anything from F1 to F12. Basically, when you boot up your computer, you probably get a message under the, uh, the motherboard maker logo, which is going to tell you how to enter setup or configuration. Uh, if you don't have this message or if you don't know which key to press, you can look up uh, your uh, manufacturer and see which key is traditionally associated with BIOS. Now, in this interface, you're going to have to be careful because you can mess up your system. So only change what you're certain about. And what you're going to have to look for is something called boot sequence or hard drive priority sequence, something like that. You're going to navigate there and you're going to tell your computer to start trying to boot from the USB key and then from your hard drive. This means that if there's no USB key, it's going to boot from the hard drive. And if there's a USB key, it's not going to boot from the hard drive, it's going to boot from the USB key. It's that simple. Once you're done, basically you press F10 to save and exit the BIOS. It's universally this key, I think. And the computer is going to reboot and it's going to boot from the USB key. Now your next step is to try out the distribution. And this one is a fun one because you're going to boot from the live USB, you're going to have a live session and you can do anything you want as long as you don't touch your existing hard drive, you're not going to destroy anything. So you can install programs, you can try to go on the internet, you can test all your peripherals. And that's the thing I would recommend you do. Plug in every single thing you have into that live session. Try out your graphics card, your webcams, your capture cards, your gaming devices, your steering wheels, everything. And make a list of what works and what doesn't. And for what doesn't, Check it out online if you haven't already done it at the beginning of your journey to moving to Linux. And if you're certain that's the distro for you, you can start the installer right from the live USB. If you don't like it, you can go back to the drawing board, try to find another distribution that suits you better. Now the next step is to install the distribution, obviously. And nowadays, the various Linux installers are super easy to use. They're basically a case of the next, next, next and finish. Uh, they're super easy to install. The only step that you need to be very careful about is your hard drive partitioning. Uh, every Linux uh, installer will offer you two options. Uh, you can erase the whole disk and replace it with the distro. That's the easy solution, but everything you had on your hard drive will be wiped out. So if you hadn't back up your data and if you want to keep uh, your existing operating system, this is not a good option for you. And then there's the option to dual boot, which is basically dividing your hard drive into two sectors called partitions. You're going to have your Windows partition or Mac OS partition, and you're going to have your Linux partition. And basically the installer gives you a little slider that you can just move around to select which space to allot to Linux and which space to allot to your existing operating system. Be careful with that one. Uh, make sure you have backed up your system in both cases, whether you want to erase or whether you want to dual boot. Make sure you have backups because it's going to mess up your hard drive. If you don't, you might lose some data. There's always a risk. Now, during the installation, you will be asked as well to create a user account. So select a username. Basically, that's your choice. Select a name for the computer, which is going to appear on the network and select a password. I would recommend you select a strong one and remember it carefully, because if you don't have it, you can't install programs. You can plug in into your session. You can modify some configurations. It's your master password. If you forget that one, you're pretty much screwed. So just remember that or use something that you know you will remember. And once the installer is done, it's going to prompt you to reboot and you just have to do that. Now, after reboot, if you're selected to dual boot, you might see an ugly black and white screen. It's called Grub. 
and it's a boot manager. It allows you to select from which operating system you want to boot. So basically, if you have a dual boot between Windows and Ubuntu, it's going to list Windows and Ubuntu, and a few more options for Ubuntu. That's the secondary function of Grub, which allows you to boot from all the Linux kernels. Uh, some updates will give you a new version of the Linux kernel, and sometimes this update will break some support for some peripheral or something. It's rare, but it happens. If it happens to you, don't worry, you just reboot and select the older kernel that worked for you. So basically the version just right before you update it. And now you can log in into your new Linux system and it's a beautiful experience. What I would recommend is grab your hard drive where you backed up all your data, copy it back onto your Linux partition and try to open every type of file you have. Try to open your Word documents, your Excel spreadsheets, your PowerPoints, your image files, your whatever file you have. Try to open it and if the distro you chose doesn't have the right program to open it, look it up online, install something, play with it. For example, for documents, I would recommend LibreOffice or WPS Office. Uh, for image files, you can use the GIMP or Glimpse if you don't like the name. So take the time to learn to open the files to play with the distro, install Steam, install some games, install some, install OBS, try to stream, try to record your desktop, whatever it is, it, whatever it is you want to do on your system, try it at that moment. And if you're too scared, if you don't like it, if you feel stuck on something, Go back to your existing OS if you kept it and learn some more stuff. Look it up online. Take some time. It's going to be a lengthy process. You're not going to be ultra familiar and a super Linux power user uh, in the first few minutes, obviously. Uh, remember how long it took you to learn to use Windows or to learn to use Mac OS X. It's not an instant process and moving to a new system just because you knew another one doesn't mean that you're going to know about Linux immediately. And that's it for our first list of the steps that you need to take to move to Linux. Obviously, I'll go into more detail on most of these steps in dedicated videos. If you enjoyed this one, uh, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, or to turn on notifications. And if you really liked the video, I have a Patreon page. I'll leave a link in the description below. Now, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!